After leaving the safety of the stockade at Masseyville, he had, after all, stayed there for a couple of weeks, recuperating from his travels and doing some carpentry work. He continued his journey deeper into the heart of the Ohio country. Following the general route, the men at the town had pointed out to him on their map. The fall snow had melted and the songbirds were singing. It seemed almost that summer had come again, but all the signs around him pointed to a long and harsh winter. Whenever he entered the woods or an open field, he had gotten in the habit of taking out his rifle and doing a quick reconnoiter of the vicinity. Everything seemed calm enough, and he was very appreciative of the more pleasant temperatures, even if there was a chill bite to the autumn air. However, there was no sight or sound of danger. And so, after pausing to look around one more time, and seeing and hearing nothing, he replaced the rifle into the handcart and continued on his journey. He was ever on the lookout for a likely piece of ground where he could grow crops, timber for a cabin, and being close to a good source of water was also important. Coming up a small rise, however, he spotted a solitary figure seated beneath a tree. Was it friend or foe? Looking closer, he could see it was a white man with his rifle leaning against a tree, seeming to be without a care in the world as he tended a small fire, stirring a pot of something, and drinking from a pewter mug. It was a grizzled Scotsman by the name of Gregory Weir. Seeing no immediate harm, he replaced the rifle and drew nearer with the handcart. Hello, the fire! How do? Please, come on in. At the invitation, he lowered the cart staves and began to remove his outer accoutrements. He had been pulling the cart for several hours, and he was a mite tired from the rugged terrain. A rest would indeed be welcome. I'm making some harmony. If you sit down, I'll fix you a bowl. Much obliged. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Been here long? I've been here for about 10 years or so. I'd like to say a mite of a prayer. Please do. Almighty God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the circumstances which have brought us together around this fire. We pray your blessing upon our companionship and upon our journeys and keep us safe in all we do in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen and amen. I've been looking for a good piece of bottom land with a nice area, a high rise, uh, close to some good water where I can build a cabin and grow some crops. Oh, I know just the place you're looking for. If you go on the path you're going for about 11 miles and 
when you come to the creek, you ford the creek, and then you go right, and then you'll find uh, some bottom land with ample water that you can grow your crops on and arise high enough you can build a cabin on it. That sounds exactly what I'm looking for. Oh, aye, it is. He found out that Mr. Weir had gotten in a wee bit of trouble in Bonnie, Scotland, as he put it, in 1770 or so, and had stowed away on a cattle boat to the colonies. He had tended horses for a while for Lord Dunmore, and had even fought in Dunmore's War. He got lost in the Ohio for several weeks, looking for some strays, and he was discovered sleeping under a ledge by a savage named Laughing Turtle, who reassured him of friendship even speaking to him kindly in English. Mr. Weir was taken in by the tribe, who were neither bloodthirsty nor savage, and even ended up marrying Laughing Turtle's sister. Some years back, he had taken his Indian bride and moved to a cabin that Laughing Turtle had helped him build. It had been several years since he had seen his friend Laughing Turtle, but he hoped it would be soon. His Indian bride had passed away recently from the pox, and even his own health had been scarred and weakened. He had returned to this area as it was known to be a favorite hunting spot for Laughing Turtle. He hoped to see his friend one more time before he met his maker. Well, I do appreciate the meal, but I need to be on my way while there's still daylight. I've got several miles to travel, as you said. Well, thank you much. Before you go, I have something, a couple of things that you can take with you huh, on your journey. Hmm? He reached into his haversack and pulled out a small bag of parched corn and buffalo jerky. Well, I much appreciate it, but I have nothing with which to pay you. If you give me a handshake, that'll be just fine. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much. I'll be seeing you now. Yes. He loaded the generous gift into his pack. Then, after he reshouldered his load, he retrieved his canteen from beside the fire, slung it over his shoulder, and then stepped into the cart once again. What he saw made his blood run cold. There, in a large open field, was an Indian bark, Wegiwam. He couldn't tell if it was occupied, and so he cautiously stepped toward it, hammer eared back and at the ready. As he got closer, he could see that it was in a general state of disrepair, and there were some large gaps between the bark slabs. 
He quickly swept the opening with his muzzle, covering most of the interior as well. It was empty, and there were no recent tracks in the mud at the entrance. There were some cut logs at the entrance, and it was apparent that it had been done by a crosscut saw. Well, if no one was living there, this would make a dandy temporary house. So he parked the cart by one side and began to carry his belongings into the interior. The next day, he went back to Massaville and retrieved a deer skin that he had left with one of his new friends. It was nicely tanned, and he had lashed a stick of the proper length to each end for his idea. He first made sure that his abode was still secure, and then he set about his task. He stood back and admired his work. Perfect. Just enough airspace at the bottom to provide a proper draft so that the chimney flap at the top would draw properly. Squatting and looking around, he nodded to himself with satisfaction. It might leak a little here and there, but it was a definite improvement to the many hollow trees he had slept in, and with his wool blanket and a warm fire, he could get by. He had also traded some carpentry work in Massaville for a fine great coat, which would help to stave off the winter chill. Well, he didn't have to wait too long. That evening, the temperature dropped precipitously and it began to snow hard. He had plenty of firewood, and so he kept the fire in the fire pit blazing hotly. He'd also traded his woodworking talents for an excellent lantern, which helped to light up the dark interior.
Well, it was time for bed, and so he rolled up his spare shirt for a pillow, as he had done so many nights on the trail. The next morning dawned bright with a generous layer of snow all around. He had seen some buffalo tracks a day or so ago and believed that there was a small herd not far away. Today would be a great day for a hunt. He had also made himself a pair of tall moccasins for this winter and they were well greased to keep the wet out and his thick home knitted wool socks were keeping his feet as warm as toast by the fire. He tracked the herd by a large stand of cedars, heavily laden with snow. This Ohio country sure was beautiful, even in the winter. He lost the herd for a while in a stand of timber and began casting about for a sign. 
sure enough, before long, he saw the tracks once more. Their trail led him by the large creek, and he could see that the recently fallen snow was heavily trampled by their passing hoofs. He estimated it to be a herd of about 20 or so, led by a large bull. Just beyond the stand of trees, the forest opened up into a large clearing. He walked slowly and surely, putting each foot down carefully after the other. The wind was in his favor, and he was hungry. Sure enough, there they were, and not at all aware of his presence. He crept closer and closer, scarcely daring to breathe. He was so close that he could nearly taste that fresh meat. And it was going to be a delight after so many weeks on the trail. After butchering, he cached the rest of the meat and packed what he judged was about 30 pounds of buffalo meat in the hide and slung it over his shoulders with a couple of leather thongs. He intended to make a buffalo coat as soon as the hide was properly tanned and smoked. When he got back to the shelter, he saw that it was undisturbed and his were the only footprints in the snow. Using a hastily cut forked stick, he skinned the bark off partway, he began to roast a large buffalo steak over the fire pit. Yes, it was still cold, but the thrill of the hunt and the large quantity of fresh meat had him happy as a lark. It was tender and tasty, and he was grateful. 
no matter how long and hard this winter would be, the hand of providence would provide for his needs. <laughs> Outside, the tall prairie grass tossed in the cold air. But inside, he was snug and warm, and his stomach was full. Indeed, all was well in the beautiful valley of the Ohio, his promised land.